Ooh. Do we need to pause that until we're ready? Oh, you can't pause it. Oh, can you? Hello, welcome to our very first session of the PR Essentials webinar series, 12 Days of Christmas. Um, we're going to be talking about censorship in the media and the credibility of PR with president founder of Trust Relations, April, April Margulies. Um, how are you doing, April? Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. I, I can't believe I'm the, uh, the kicking this thing off. Oh, yeah. What an okay, honor. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have a good time. We're going to have a good time. It's It feels like the holidays. I should have had a Christmas tree in the back. But <laughs> other, other than that, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. This came up during our podcast, the PR Playbook podcast. Um, and actually came up today when I was talking to a client of ours. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah, just, just why it was so difficult to get media coverage these days. And um, just talking about the shifting media landscape is, is really interesting. So I'm going to hand it over to you to have you kick it off. And um, I'm excited to learn more. Awesome. Well, it's going to be a big journey today. So thank you for uh, to everyone for uh, sticking with us. We're going to start a little bit and in get into the statistics about where we're currently at. And then I'm going to borrow from some of the techniques of building trust for businesses to get into what can we do as a society to help get the credibility of the media back. So that, that's the journey we're taking today. Um, I just wanna start by the, saying the obvious, which is that the credibility of the news media in the US is hovering near all time lows now, according to recent studies. It's really alarming. About 70% of US adults say that their trust in the news media has decreased in the past decade. So this is, uh, you know, this is getting pretty serious. Um, from 2003 to 2016, Americans who have a great deal of trust in the media fell from 54%, which isn't great to begin with, right, to 32%. <clears throat> and um, <coughs> so sorry, I, I'm getting over a cold, so there may be some coughing happening throughout the webinar here today. No worries. Um, <clears throat> so most Americans now, including nine in 10 Republicans, say that they have personally lost trust in the news media in recent years. Almost all Republicans, 94%, and then political conservatives, 95%, say their trust decreased in the past decade, 75% of independents, 66% of moderates. So it's, it's obviously plummeting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to, I think that'll be the last third clear. Let's find out. So when asked to describe why they don't trust certain news organizations, most Americans responded on, adder, on matters of inaccuracy, 66% or bias. And the most commonly expressed exp uh, responses were about inaccurate reporting, misleading reporting, lies, alternative facts, fake news, are biased or are slanted or unfair reporting. About 23% say that one-sided or unbalanced or incomplete reporting causes them to distrust news organizations. And then about 16% say that quote unquote news that's grounded in opinions or emotions um, or politically or partisan focused coverage is what's causing them to lose this trust in the news organizations. What I found interesting is that young adults who are between 18 to 34 are actually twice as likely as older adults that are 55 plus to say that partisan bias or politically focused news is a really big factor in their distrust of the news media. Um, they're also more likely than older adults to mention bias, slanted, or unfair reporting, which is interesting, again, to me, because I feel like there's a legacy of, of you know, unbiased reporting among older adults, but then the young people are the ones that are actually like really alarmed by this. <clears throat> and both Republicans and Democrats were less likely to trust news sources that had a partisan reputation that opposes their own. However, what's really interesting is that they also didn't express greater trust in news organizations that have a partisan leading that matches their own. So in general, people are not trusting news organizations that have a partisan leading, even if it's consistent with what they believe. I, I think part of it is like, well, why? <laughs> but the, yeah, you know, it's, I think, I mean, it's just too much. It's uh, there's too many things to think about, and it's really hard to navigate whether, like, should I or should I not trust this? There's too many questions, so you just kind of ignore them altogether, right? Totally. 
Yeah. No. And I mean, these statistics are obviously like terrifying, right? I mean, this is, and it's especially alarming for, for PR people Mm -hmm. and businesses, but why? So, I mean, obviously for decades, businesses have been leveraging PR to build their brand's credibility, right? So we've got all these other dimensions of PR, of course, this crisis comms, et cetera. But in general, PR is really synonymous with media relations. And, you know, the definition is the art of pitching newsworthy ideas to journalists for inclusion in their stories. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that if journalists have been, you know, the traditional way for brands to get credibility built through being included in those publications, what happens when the publications no longer have the credibility that they once did, right? So instead of, you know, having this perceived value that you get from being included in the third party validation of the news organization um, stories and segments and things like that, suddenly that's gone. Um, Also, one of these things, you know, one of the things that like really the question I had about this um, uh, mostly is like because the media landscape is shifting, you know, how, how like we talked about hopefully having a journalist on here and we, we couldn't get anyone to join us today, but we will have um, some journalists in some future webinar series and I might have to recirculate and ask them the question of what is it that makes them work for a media outlet it because a lot of these people are freelancers mm-hmm. and they just need to write they need to work but then uh i remember mid 2020 where a couple of people told us and this was i probably shouldn't name the outlet but um <laughs> there was a couple of people that told us like hey you know i'm leaving this outlet because of um these guys are like not good business and i'm not i'm not, i refuse to work with them and so it was really impressive to see a journalist take a stand against their paycheck you know like mm. and leave but it's, it's just really <clears throat> interesting to see that those those dynamics are playing out in the media for sure yeah yeah um so i i like to say um you know that advertising is kind of like going to an open mic if you're a you know an artist and you're introducing yourself on the stage and it's kind of like Okay, yeah, sure, you're great. But PR is obviously the place where it's more like having an established artist that introduces you as the next up and coming act and you're the best thing that's ever happened and you're on a large stadium stage, right? So there's something about PR that no other part of the marketing mix can really match, right? Yeah. Um, And it works, obviously, again, because in the past, we've traditionally viewed media as being an unbiased source of information. So they're therefore, you know, providing a platform of, of credibility building. Um, <clears throat> but the, the big issue is that what happens if obviously what we're saying is the media starts to not have the same level of credibility and it doesn't have the same feeling of independence. And then what happens in terms of PR? Have right? you ever had that experience where you're <laughs> like, who fact checked this story? Like who, who actually... Like, yeah, we, we pitch stuff all the time, right? Like we, we hope to think we're drinking our juice. We, we love our clients and we want to pitch their story. But at the end of the day, it's like such a big responsibility to make sure that what they're saying is right. And what we're saying is right. right. Like it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, sometimes I wonder like, are we in the right business? Because we're pitching all different kinds of stories all the time, but it's really the journalist's responsibility to make sure they're saying the right thing. And, I, and it's just like, it's very nerve wracking. Like, like what you're saying here is just, it really does build on the fi- foundational elements of public relations, what we do and, and how brands are perceived. It's just like crazy to see that, you know, the statistics that you presented about the trust, because there goes PR out the window. <laughs> Exactly. No, that that's exactly right. And that's why, I mean, that's why I'm so passionate. I'm actually a former journalist myself, as you know, I think, yeah. but it's also, you know, in general, this is a really concerning situation, not just for publicists, obviously, because what happens to our industry, but also what in the world is going to happen as a society if we no longer have an opportunity for people to feel like they have unbiased sources of information right Mm -hmm. the entire you know freedom of america is like built on having freedom of speech freedom of the press freedom of religion right so so what happens if it starts to feel like that's dwindling right yeah so so it's a big deal obviously um 
you know, there's another, uh, there's more scary statistics here about 44% of <laughs> Americans saying that they can actually think of a news source that reports the news objectively, 44%, that's it. That they, can, they cannot think of an, a news organization that uh, reports objectively. 66% uh, of Americans say that news media outlets do a really poor job of separating fact from opinion. That's uh -huh. bad. That's 66%, right? This is like, and it's, uh, you know, it was only 42% in 1984. So this is getting worse. Um, there was a, a really great study that I, I'm going to get into in a little bit here, but basically, you know, trustworthiness and credibility are not inherent or objective features of the news media. They're products of news users' perception. So this is where it's important that we're, we're thinking about how, how the media is being perceived and then how do we change that perception um, as a society. So, you know, we've had issues over the past years of democratic societies in general and journalism specifically that have had this big debate about, you know, whether they can trust the news media in substantial parts of their population. It's not limited to the US either, right? This has actually been an issue um, globally. And so the internet has also created this high choice environment yeah. for news consumption, which has then challenged traditional news media's prerogative to report, interpret, and comment on political as well as society issues, which is then giving rise to these alternative news sources, which is something that I'm sure a lot of people on the webinar today are very familiar with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's good and bad, right? It provides more opportunities for us as publicists, but it's also, um, you know, fragments everything. So, right. It makes it more, much more confusing. Yeah. If you, much if you more. Yeah. That's right. And then where, where's the audience? Where's the target? target audience? I mean, in one of these, it had the virus, like the word virus in the news. Um, and it's funny because my husband and I were just so conflicted of like, where are we going to get our news? This was early in COVID. Yeah. Where are we going to get our news about this? That's like trustworthy and that we can depend on. And what we ended up doing, which is like kind of crazy, we had to stop after a couple of months, but every day we would look at the CDC like official report because we felt like that was the only credible piece of paper that we could find that would show us what the status of the virus was. But it's that kind of thing is like crazy rabbit hole stuff, right? Like, so you're totally. like- <laughs> we're not interpreting it. We're not doctors. Like we just really had nowhere to go. It was very puzzling. And I can only imagine that's me, somebody who works with the media all the time. Uh, imagine like a lot of people who don't understand the media, uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing, what they're going, what they're thinking about what's going on. I mean, no wonder everyone's in a mental crisis right now. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I mean, so, and then the other issue that's sort of fueling this idea of independent news sources is this growing concern over censorship, right? Which is, mm -hmm. is sort of in the title. And that's obviously something that, that we talked about on the podcast as well. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, this is, this has become, oops, there's a, a new study from the Media Research Center that showed that broadcast news networks recently favored stories o about censorship over free speech. So, for example, there was um, the report that, you know, several incidences of major tech platforms like Facebook and Google and YouTube, and they were limiting and censoring information mm -hmm. regarding of COVID-19 related posts. And most notably in September that the company step up its efforts to limit and ban videos that spread, quote, misinformation right, regarding right, the COVID-19 vaccine. Yep. And so basically <clears throat> what this study said is that there was an increased censor the inc the the increased censorship received positive news coverage on broadcast evening news so pro censorship stories and mentions outnumbered those supporting free speech 12 wow. to 0 12 wow. to 0 on evening news networks um and there was a lot of it that focused on this like network support for the push to restrain coronavirus content so <laughs> it was, that's uh, crazy do people just i mean is it because of the comfort level you think that the audience feels of like controlling the message i think that has to be what it is is that they are assuming but i think they might be wrongly assuming this right yeah. i don't know that the audience because i think what we're seeing here is that <clears throat> people are not trusting the censorship of information but yet there's somehow this disconnect right where it's like yeah were pro censorship instead of pro free speech. And I don't know quite when that happened. <laughs> yes. 
like when did that become a tenet of American freedom? You know, right. I don't I don't know when that entered society as an acceptable norm. Well, and um, the cannabis, I mean, the cannabis industry is like this perfect example of this. <laughs> I mean, um, we've been doing some work in cannabis and like, you know, obviously people, if, if you're in cannabis or if you've heard of it, people are getting banned off of Instagram for posting certain things. And a lot of media outlets won't even touch the topic until it's federally legal. So it's like, you see that, but it's just, it's just a plant. You can't talk about it. Like this is, it's, it's really interesting. And then people are getting, um, you know, I think this is another thing that is worrisome for me, especially in the censorship of the media is, is it really a money thing? Is it, is it all about how much money you're making or not making, or, you know, um, rather than freedom of speech, which is what you're talking about here. Right. No, and it, I mean, and that, and that's right. And that's where people get worried too. And I, obviously people are worried about, you know, is, are the pharma companies the one that are driving all the information because they're the ones that are financially benefiting. Right. And so therefore, do we trust the information that's coming through that's being censored, that's not being censored, or is it driven by the market forces of big pharma, which obviously is like the richest, you know, industry in the world. So yeah, yeah, it's, I don't, yeah, it, it's, it's really, um, I think people don't realize what a thin line it is to walk and, um, you know, it's, it's, this conversation is specifically interesting. I mean, because mostly because we're pitching stuff every day and a lot of times I would say maybe the first 10 years of me being a PR person, like really didn't think about, um, if someone's reviewing my pitch and seeing if it's appropriate or, if they're, you know, censoring it because of the type of company I'm working for or mm -hmm. because whatever. I mean, I never really thought about that. And now it's like, sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, why would this be rejected? This is like a really good inf piece of information people should have. Like, there's no reason that we shouldn't talk about yes. it. And it's, it's, you don't like, it takes a minute to sink in, to think that yeah. people are actually manipulating the news. No, it, it's kind of terrifying. We actually had a client recently who was doing antibody testing before it was, you know, very widely used and it was viewed as anti-vax, even though their position was not anti-vax, right. but because there was this extra element where it's like, they were calling out the fact that people that were fully vaccinated were not actually a hundred percent full of antibodies. Right. And so they right. were saying, to uh, um, do risk aversion, you need to make sure that you're actually also ensuring that antibodies are present even after you've gotten the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the like the yardstick we should be using to measure whether people are safe. Right. And then it was completely rejected because it flew in the face of the ongoing narrative about the vaccine, even though the company itself was not anti-vax. So it was like, right. oh my god, and we couldn't. I mean, we could not break through. Because yeah. no reporter wanted to touch it because it was like kryptonite. I mean, these are these are things that you'll have to consider. Like, what are the ancillary ancillary things that are going to affect your story? And sometimes we don't have any control over that, right? No, not really. I mean, yeah. you can try to fit into the context, but if your client is going against the grain of the of the whatever the accepted narrative of the moment is, mm -hmm. God help you. You know. Yeah. Like it's like, and, and, and that's a problem because we're trying to help get information out that people need to have. And in the case of the antibody testing, it was mm -hmm. like, this is information people should have. They should know that, you well, know, this is, this is, this is actually great. I think uh, a point to kind of resonate on a lot uh, or dig into a little bit how as a PR person, and I mean, I have some thoughts, but like how as a PR person, do you take the next step to continue to spread that information, that mm -hmm. education. Like how do you, what is the next step as, as in a PR program or a communications program? What do you do for those people? Well, then I think you have to find the reporters that are actually willing to circumvent the accepted narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think things like Substacks, which we're going to get into in a minute, actually okay. come into play because you have to find somebody that's willing to step outside of whatever the what's comfortable yeah what's comfortable or even the outlet right because in some cases those outlets are not going to let that information through because they have people they're beholden to mm -hmm. right that 
what are you going to do if the <laughs> owners of the outlet yeah are being paid for and bought and sold by big pharma that has xyz agenda right right what do you, how right. in the world do you get around getting the information out so then i think you have to look for reporters and freelancers and substack writers and you know people that are actually like willing to step outside of the of that mainstream narrative and be bold and like yeah no i love i love that that's a great i you mean know. i'm i'm, I'm going to wait now till you get to that point cuz i i love to hear a little more um, about that so, so just to, to put a bow on this particular study so yeah. they also found that of the other 20% of evening um network news broadcasts that were covering big tech censorship 3 of 15 were neutral but zero, none, zilch, none of the stories took a pro free speech position. And this is coming from the free speech America analysis of ABC, CBS, and NBC evening news um, coverage of the third quarter news coverage. So <clears throat> it's, uh, it's interesting. Let's, yeah. let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and then the, the same uh, center, the Media Research Center, reported similar outcomes in April and July, grading the tech giants, including Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok with D or F grades. Nice. In regards to free speech. Oh so apparently God. free speech has gone out the window and everyone's pro censorship. I don't but, know. But Again. you can, but you can post a dance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know post when this happened. I don't yeah. know when this happened, but yeah. yeah. Yo, you can post a dance, but you can't, uh, you can't post anything that, uh, that's uh, misinformation. <laughs> um, so anyway, against this backdrop, again, just to bring it full circle, it's like, it's no surprise, right? That more than nine in 10 of Republicans say they've personally lost trust in the news media in recent years. Um, and obviously it's not just Republicans, but yeah. but there's still an issue here with, with that side of the equation feeling especially um, disenfranchised by the media. <clears throat> um, so, you know, a lot of these news and social outlets are then, oops, sorry, I skipped on accident. Here we go. So there's a bunch of, uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of right wing, they're calling them right wing. I don't know if that's even PC, but let's okay. say there's a bunch of new alternative news sources, social apps, et cetera, that are being created to circumvent what they see as being this increasingly liberal internet and media ecosystem, right? So there's the Daily Wire and there's MeWe Network and there's Blaze TV and Parler and Newsmax TV and Oon and Clout Hub and Rumble. And like, they're all rising up to sort of fill in this, what they see as a vacuum in the, the existing system. <clears throat> and um, obviously they're designed to push back against what they think is censorship or cancel culture and that kind of thing. Um, why is this being so sticky? Here we go. Okay, so this is where we're getting to substacks, which we which we we talked about for a second here. Yeah. So some of what's happening also is that there's a further fractionalization of news sources that's been accelerated over the last year because there's been this rise of substack newsletters. Um, and then there's other independent newsletters yeah. following in the footsteps of Substack that are rising up as well. So yeah, if anybody ever said email was dead, boy, were they wrong. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. So for those who don't know, uh, basically, instead of, you know, subscribing to a newspaper or magazine now, you can actually pay directly for a newsletter that's produced by your favorite writer. So you, some of them are free. Some of them are $5 a, a month. Some of them are $10 a month, but basically it's creating this industry <clears throat> where writers with a following can drive really big numbers with their creativity and their reporting. Um, some of these reporters are making millions of dollars and I'm not exaggerating. Wow. So they went from being journalists who were like, you know, starving artists style, you know, reporters to actually um, if they had a follow, if they have a following now, they're, they're actually able to make unlimited money basically. But weren't, point. weren't journalists always the original influencers anyway? I mean, of I think, course. I think it's a deserving, I think that's a <laughs> deserving group of, of media that should be getting, I mean, influence, like I was mentioning, like there's people who are just dancing on TikTok that are making millions of dollars. I'd much rather give my money to a media or a journalist who's doing research to figure out what the like real stories are, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and report the real news. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, the New York Times recently wrote this. They said Substack has captivated an anxious industry because it embodies larger forces and contradictions. For one, the new media economy promises both to make some writers rich and turn others into content creation equivalent of Uber drivers, even <laughs> as journalists turn increasingly to labor unions to level up pay scales. Um, so, you know, as publicists, what is our opportunity here? Well, first of all, Substack has promised no ads ever. So that leads an opportunity for us to, you know, connect with these audiences through popular writers. And I have to point out here that this is actually, I mean, we're talking about this mushrooming. Mm -hmm. It was 250,000 subscriptions last November. It's now more than a million. Wow. So it is like booming as a, as a, as a platform. Um, in addition to that, what's interesting is that a lot of traditional media outlets are trying to get in on the trend. So they want to be are. part of, <laughs> of course they are. So now the Atlantic has one, the New York times has one, these independent newspaper platforms that they're launching in response to this growing popularity. But then how, how can they really be independent though? Like, are they really, it's just, you're piggybacking on a trend and trying to take it back. You're trying to take it back, basically. Well, that's what I find a little bit funny because it's a, it's very me too. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, these are like punk rockers who are doing their own thing and uh, not on a label. And then it's suddenly like, you know, a music label that's then trying to launch their own independent, you know, super indie punk label. Rock. Yeah. <laughs> indie label. Like, okay. I don't know if that's going to work, but, uh, but they're trying. Yeah. So, yeah. So more power to them. Um, I think in general, for me, what really is, you know, the thing that I'm most concerned about is how do we reunite the country? Because I feel like there have become these echo chambers within the media mm -hmm. and how are we going to regain the population's trust in the media in a, in a cohesive way where we're all getting information from similar sources, right? This is, yeah. this is like a very big issue in terms of our um, democracy, I think. Well, one of the most immediate examples that I could really think of, and obviously completely like self-serving, totally different, but like, because we work in consumer tech so much, holiday gift guides are like the perfect example. I know it sounds kind of funny, but like <laughs> in the past, you know, we're, well, these are, these are entertainment stories. These are like what to buy, right? This is like diving into consumerism, but now we can't even get cool products and holiday gift guides unless you have some kind of affiliate program or some kind of connection with the brand where they're going to get a kickback on money. I mean, everyone is so focused on the money part of, of the story, which, 100%. which makes sense. That's totally fine. But, but like, doesn't that take away from what we organically thought was fun journalism? And I think, I think of consumer tech holiday gift guides as fun journalism, right? Like that's just like fun stuff to watch, but you can't even do that anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No. And if you're not right, if you're not on those affiliate programs, you're not, you're not even going to get considered. Oh no. Yeah. Like, I mean, business insider is a great example. And there's a lot of publications like that. And wire cutter. I mean, everyone has some kind of thing where you have to, and if not, you're like immediately cut off. That's it. You, yep. you don't even have a chance. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting to hear that from the reporters too. It's like, sorry, we can't take you. We're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's definitely a blurring of the line between earned media and paid media. Right. And, and, and I think it's, I, I mean, the concern that I have is that it's just going to be a further decline of the credibility of the media because it's right. people, I mean, we know as publicists what's happening behind the scenes, but it's a matter of time before people that are regular citizens you know understand as well that those gift guides that they're looking at are actually influenced by advertise yeah, yeah money yeah it's absolutely. money it's money it's still money it's not actually you know these are the best um the dishwashers for 2022 or yeah. whatever it is you know what I mean like it's like because you want to know as a consumer I mean I do right when I go to shop for things right. like that what was actually high, highly rated and yeah. what was, you know, but it's, it's sort of like falling on the shoulders of consumer reports and then everyone else, you just know it's, you're being sold to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. so, 
Um, so in this study that I referenced earlier, they have these four dimensions of journalistic selectivity that influence the credibility. And uh, so one is, you know, trust in the selectivity of the topics that you're choosing to write about. One is trust in the selectivity of the facts that you're choosing to, to include in those stories. Um, one is the trust in the accuracy of the depictions. And then the other one is trust in the journalistic assessment. So related to the classification and weighing of what information was included or not included or communicated. Um, and so I think, you know, there's obviously people have been studying this, which is uh, a relief to me in a way, because it was like, okay, I want to know that people are trying to figure this out. Somebody's um, worried. <laughs> what's that? Somebody is worried about it. Somebody, at least somebody's <laughs> just, worried. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Um, and I, and I mentioned this earlier, but they also found in this study that basically, you know, like there was a, a lack of trust in, spe in specific news outlets, but also just in general in the domestic and international systems as a whole. Mm -hmm. So it's not, this is a widespread thing. This isn't one news outlet that's got a bad reputation. This is a, this is a, you know, right. a, a massive issue. Um, what was also interesting to me in this study is that the news organization's history, longevity, or reputation, or legacy was not actually frequently cited as a key trust factor. So people didn't care if it was the New York Times and they had, yeah. and they had, you know, a bunch of awards or whatever. Um, they didn't, nobody cared whether it had awards, whether it had um, some great history, nothing like that. It was, that was mostly irrelevant in terms of whether people trusted the outlet, which is, wow. I, I found interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then they said that 64% uh, rated a news organization um, clearly distinguishing news stories from commentary analysis or advertising, advertiser paid content is very important in their trust. And I think this is really important mm. for us to keep in mind as, as, you know, publicists and journalists and businesses, because what they're saying here is that there's a, there's this blurring of the line between news stories and then this opinion. And I think, I've seen that even recently. I don't know if you feel this way as well, but I feel like a lot of the news that I'm seeing has a very hard slant. And it's like, it's more like PR writing in my mind than journalism right. because it has a lot of, um, it packs a punch of like a real opinion and a real angle and a real point of view. And I feel like the news is not meant to do that. And I right. feel like there's become, I think part of the issue with people not trusting the media is that there's this blurring of the line between reporting of facts and mm -hmm. this commentary. Well, and I know? like what, I like what this statistic is saying too. I agree with this. I agree that like, maybe you don't care so much. <laughs> You're not, you don't not trust somebody who clearly labels what's going on. You know what I mean? There's yeah. clear labels. You're not drinking Kool-Aid, you know, out of the like Sunny D cup or something like that. You know, like, you know what you're getting. And I think in that way, that builds trust because you know, okay, fine. I'm reading this advertiser paid content, but at least I know that it's paid by an advertiser. And if I choose to accept or believe it, that's my, that's my prerogative. So it's giving the power back to the reader and the viewer. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I, I found that one interesting. Um, basically the other thing that they discovered in this, it was a very, very long report. I'm trying to distill it, but it was, it was quite boring and it took hours to go through. Um, so anyway, but they also found that, that basically when trust is lost, that the journalists need to give their, their audience a chance to check whether their reporting was accurate. So if the audiences can verify information, that was provided by the news media, then they start to trust them again. Um, mm -hmm. And this is going to come up again in a little bit, but you know, basically the point here is that the more that the media shows the, the behind the scenes facts and statistics and things like that, that they're including, the more that the readers feel confident that they can verify it. And I think that goes back again to this idea of like, you want 
you want to respect the readers that they can interpret the information you're presenting without you putting your handprints <laughs> and color and opinion and you know, I mean, I think people feel, I think part of what's happening is people are feeling talked down to mm. because they're being told what to believe. Mm -hmm. And I think people want to be respected as readers to say, I, I'm an intelligent person who can interpret what you're presenting to me yeah. without you telling me how to feel about it. Right, right. And right. I think part of what's happening is that people are starting to lose trust because they feel talked down to through this over opinionated presentation. Yeah. So well, that makes sense. That makes yeah, sense for sure. Um, oops, sorry. Why is this? It keeps doing this to me. There we go. <laughs> okay. So the credibility of a news story is perceived as higher when the story has one of three things or all three scientific sources statistical information or a visualization of the statistical information. Can I say this yeah. visualization of statistical information? I did it. Yeah. Um, so I think that this is also an important point because as publicists, we want to make sure that to help the media with their credibility mm -hmm. and even the perceived credibility of those stories that we're providing this kind of information, right? Yeah. So and I, have... I think, I think it's even more important that like now we're doing a lot of like bylines and contributed articles and things like that yeah. for, for when people see that it's by a brand, if you can, if we could also include all these three elements, then we can be perceived as trustworthy. So that's, exactly. I, I, this is a very important slide. Mm -hmm. Screenshot okay. this guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, Okay, so um, there is a little bit of a dilemma here, which mm -hmm. is that they also discovered that while including this kind of extra detail increases the credibility, it also makes new stories harder to comprehend for large right. parts of the population <laughs> and also more demanding to consume. So right. there is a little bit of a like journalistic dilemma that is happening um, between trying to give people information, but also make things still easy to digest. Right. Right. Um, yeah. there is some good news. I know this has been very doomsday-ish, but yeah. <laughs> of the 69% of us adults who have lost trust in the news media over the past decade, they do say their trust can be restored. I do need to point out, however, this still means that 21% of all us adults say their trust in the media cannot be restored full stop. Mm -hmm. So specifically about one third um, especially those on the political right say they have permanently lost faith in the media. Wow. One, one third of us adults. That's a lot of people. It's a that lot of people. Crazy. That is crazy. A lot so of where people. do they get their information though? Well, some of those are, you know, we, we went through some of those like alternative, <laughs> yeah, right. Alternative right? media sources. Okay. Media sources. So I think, I mean, there's, I think they'll probably continue to be those rising up unless there's a shift where things that are previously considered mainstream are, you know, back to the point where people are trusting them. Or do you think maybe, I mean, I've seen this shift over the last maybe three years, three to five years, but do you think then the onus becomes on the brands and the businesses and the companies to be more transparent and you know, obviously like, you know, a lot of times when we create strategic communications programs, we're talking about educating your consumer. So like properly educating the consumer, having a little bit more like authority and equity in what you're saying um, and authenticity to be able to say that things that are credible, right? Like, like you said, like having supporting quotes, scientific facts, things like that. But it, does that become the responsibility of the brand now? I think so. Yes. And I think, and I think a lot of it, and um, we'll see if we have time to get into this, but yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is that brands in general need to be coherent within themselves. Right. So well, they need to... that's a different, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> it's another rabbit hole, yeah. but, but yes, but I think in general, Yes. I think it's, I think the onus is on, I, I honestly, I think this is not necessarily 
something, I don't want to point fingers at the no. news media per se, or even journalists. I think this is a society issue, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's really important that we're talking about it today. Cause it's, yeah. it's, it's really, I mean, again, I'm, I'm going to get into a little bit more of this, but I just feel like in general, how are we going to come together as a society? If we can't agree on information that we're, that we can verify collectively Mm -hmm. that we're both, you know, that both sides of the party or people even the center feel like they can trust they're getting information that's unbiased and, you know, and fair, right? So, so this is actually a great segue here. So we've got more than seven in 10 say these are the following things that are really important to them for trusting the media. So mm -hmm. fairness, 78%, fact-checking resources, 74%. Uh, commitment to transparency, 71%, and then providing links to research and facts to back up reporting, 71%. Yeah. So these are, these are the factors that I think in general are really the most important to people in terms of trying to get trust back in the media. Um, the other thing that I found interesting is that people said that they trusted news organizations less if the speed of reporting was prioritized over accuracy. And I know this is, I mean, this has been an ages old question, but it's sure. gotten crazier yeah. and crazier in the digital world, right? Where people are just first yeah. to market, I'm first to report it, I'm first to say it. And the problem with that is that the more that you push to say something before you had a chance to verify everything and do it and do careful reporting is then your accuracy suffers and then your trust suffers. Right. So, you know, they also trusted outlets more that have a really um, visible and quick record of making corrections of mistakes. So they want to see that you're willing to say, you know, and not hide it and pretend that it didn't happen. But they right. want to know if you make a mistake, you're going to claim it and you're going to make it a visible correction and not something that you just try to sweep under the rug. <laughs> Yeah, reputation management 101 right there. <laughs> 100%. That's right. That's right. Um, people are also more distrusting of news organizations that do not acknowledge conflicts of interest. Oh, they want to they want to know who are your sponsors? Who owns you? Right? Who are your advertisers? Who are the people that are influencing what you're including in your coverage? And if you don't acknowledge those conflicts of interest, they don't trust you. Um uh, the other thing that they said, again, is, you know, this is, this keeps coming up, but they want additional research publicly available. So they trust outlets that, for example, provide unedited interviews. So you can see for mm -hmm. yourself what happened behind the scenes, right? What was the full 60 minutes interview? What was the full whatever interview? Right. Um, not just what were the snippets and the sound bites that you chose to, to pick well, of out course, yeah. and cherry pick and turn into a story. I'm going to sound bite this interview. It's going to be great. <laughs> but well, one of the questions, go, if you're going, going back to that last um, slide that you had, yeah. one of the things is like, I think one thing that we experience that a lot of people don't realize and and maybe they already think advertising influences editorial. And, and in some cases, I'm sure it does. But a lot of times, like I just did a huge, um, I just did a huge uh, thing about advertising last week. It was a project, big advertising project. And the advertising department does not talk to the editorial department, like 0% in most cases. And so a lot of times, <laughs> You know, like I don't, I don't even, they don't even know what's going on on the other side. And, and I hear, I hear that happening all the time. Now, I don't know if they're just telling me that, but, but most of the time, that's what I hear is that they're completely separate departments and they don't know what the other, you know, what the right arm is doing. The left arm doesn't know what the right arm is doing. Um, and so like in this situation, like, you know, who's the person to identify those conflicts of interest? That's a really good question. I mean, I guess it would have to be the publisher, right? That's actually- Oh yeah, yeah. Like, hey, what? everyone, you should check if these people are in bed with us already. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. And the other thing that, that came up, which I think is up in a minute here. I mean, the other thing that I think is coloring a lot of people's trust or distrust of the media is also that there's um unfortunately too many opinion leaders that are associated 
with those outlets that have partisan or leanings or biases or whatever. And so there's this, um, unfortunately, there's a blurring of, again, okay, this outlet is represents this kind of partisan leaning because they have these thought leaders that are attracting people and, you know, these opinion leaders and things like that, that are, that are vocal and commentary commentators and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think the other issue that's happened is that there's this problem of people that are like, like lightning rods when I'm trying to say, right. Like those big personalities that have lots of opinions that have a lot of partisan color. And then that is then making people distrust news Mm -hmm. because it's all in the same big soup. Yeah. You know, you don't have an outlet that's devoted to opinion and then an outlet that's devoted to news. You have both. So then which yeah, how do you make that decision? Yeah. 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 So it's a, it's, it's an, it's an issue. Um, so the study says to regain trust in the media, it organizations are going to be required to do the following. So number one, rigorously adhere to journalistic norms. This has become really challenging in an era where staff and resources have been yeah. slashed, oh obviously. So this is, this is a big issue. Um, this is one I was just bringing up. Be careful not to be branded by opinion leaders as liberal or conservative, which can turn off these large segments of the population and damage their trust in the overall outlet. Um, Disclose the conflicts of interest like we were talking about before, and then make additional reporting material and unedited interviews available to readers and viewers. So hopefully these four things are, you know, something that is going to help get the the media back on a, on its footing get the behind the scenes footage here that's right that's right <laughs> <laughs> um so in general i was going to get into a lot more of the sort of the like trust building techniques in business and how they would apply mm-hmm. to journalism but i think in the interest of time because i'm looking at the clock here i'm going to sort of i'm going to fly through s- some of these slides here sure and, and get us to um to the meat of it. So let me I just... saw Stephen Covey and the Dalai Lama. We're missing their wise advice now. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's I, I I didn't I didn't know it would be interactive. So I was prepared for like just being out on a limb by myself, but I'm so glad that I haven't been. No, so, never. <laughs> so thank you for uh th- making this engaging. Um but let me just skip ahead. So they're basically just to to give the the sort of really quick version. So there are 13 behaviors that build trust. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead to what those are. And then I'm going to skip ahead, even though I've completely cut out, unfortunately, like, you know, this, this, how this happens, but do listen to Stephen Covey's book, um, which is absolutely amazing. Um, But anyway, so let's, let's just sort of skip through to the, to the, uh, to the 13 things. And then I'm going to talk because I jumped then from there to how to actually build trust in the media. Okay based on those 13 behaviors. So just one moment. Sorry, you're going to see how many crazy slides I did. I warned you. That's warned a, this is this perfect. Slide. If someone wants to slow it down in slow motion, they can get the whole thing. <laughs> they get the whole thing. We're almost there, I promise. <laughs> it's it's like, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost there. We're almost there. It's 13. There it is. There it is. Okay, so we are to, here we go. All right. Bringing it full circle. So these are the behaviors that build trust in general, right? If you're, whether you're a business or you're an individual or you're a business leader, um, talking straight, number one, demonstrating respect, creating transparency, righting wrongs. I like that one. (laughs) um, Showing loyalty, delivering results, getting better, confronting reality, Clarifying expectations, practicing accountability, listening first before speaking, (laughs) keeping commitments, and extending trust to other people. So basically, if you apply those 13 behaviors to the media, Mm -hmm. then what I have done in the next few slides here that we're going to skip ahead to, so um, maybe someday we can do the the full the full presentation (laughs) but uh but for now basically talk straight right so what would that mean in terms of the media will be neutral Mm -hmm. be unbiased in your tone right 
um, distinguish news stories from commentary, from analysis, from advertiser paid content. Uh, be objective, right? Move away from this idea of narratives and interpretations and anecdotal examples and all of that kind of stuff. Um, use simple language, call things what they are, demonstrate your integrity, um, don't manipulate people or distort the facts, right? There's a lot of like spinning of the truth. And, and you know, you know, it's, what's funny is because I think how this, this has become a snowball. I think it was, it started like this and one person took a little bit of a liberty and then everything else snowballed from there. So they're like, oh, I can push this part of it. So maybe I can push this other part of it. And so I think that's what's happened and we just need to dial it back. But um, you really have to be like, be objective and neutral. Those seem to be like really the core tenets of like, you, you can't put your opinion or feelings into it. That's right. No. And I mean, I, I, you know, even as a journalism student, I, I don't know how I got from what I learned in college. And I mean, I'm dating myself because I feel very old thinking about, <laughs> you know, 1996 or whatever it was like, but like, <laughs> what, what, how did it go from there to it's factually accurate, but we're leaving false impressions and we're like yeah, putting in yeah. a lot of like opinion and thoughts about things. I don't, I don't know how it went from being the watchdog of society that reports facts to, to this thing that it is. Right. 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 Yeah. How did we go? I don't know how we got there. Yeah. Like, those little, like those little happened. tiny, those little liberties that you make turned into huge snowball. Huge. That's huge right. Snowball. That's yeah. right. Um, so the second quality of building trust is demonstrating respect. And I think, again, you know, this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Like, I think you have to make the additional research publicly available and trust the readers that they're going to be able to interpret that. Right. I don't think you want to treat re readers like they need you to handhold through every single thing that you're presenting with that. If you, I feel like it then treats them like they're unintelligent or they're incapable right. of correcting, correctly interpreting the information that's presented. And I just don't think that builds trust. Right. right. Um, number three, create transparency. So you have to tell the truth in a way people can verify. I think it also means you have to avoid censorship of news information, statistics, and opinions, honestly. Right. Mm -hmm. I think you have to actually be transparent, provide the information, let people decide for themselves, provide the scientific sources, the statistics, the visualizations, Yeah, you know, reveal all those conflicts of interest about- I think, I think the owners. problem here is people don't realize that there's a lot of opinion weaved into things. Maybe they believe them to be facts and not opinion. So it's really the responsible wrong, responsibility of the reporter or the journalist or the news giver, uh, whoever that is. Yeah, the outlet, yeah. Yeah, to do that because, I mean, sometimes the audience can only see what they see and maybe they don't even realize that that it's opinion or they, they can't, you know, I mean, sometimes I, I don't know. I'm like, wait, did, are they telling me that or are they asking me that? You know, it's like, you can't really make that delineation sometimes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue for the, you know, people trusting the media. Right. Um, writing wrongs. This is a, you know, obviously making quick and visible corrections, making yeah. sure that you're, you write things when you're wrong, you apologize quickly, you know? Um, and I think in general, it also means not letting like the pride or the profits get in the way of reporting the truth. Yeah. So if something needs to be reported and it, you know, it's, it flies in the face of your advertisers, you're not, you're not going to have anybody's trust if you decide to err on the side of, you know, yeah, pleasing your advertisers. Nobody's going to trust your, your product. And then the problem is that, okay, great. Well, you please your advertisers, but now your viewers or your readers no longer trust you. So your quality of your product has gone in the yeah. toilet and then and then there goes now, your advertisers. And then there go your advertisers, right? So it's like you have to, you know, you know prioritize, yeah. you know, providing content that's actually providing plain facts over this, like the ratings and the buzz and the, you know, sensational headlines and all of that stuff, right? Show loyalty is the fifth quality of building trust. So 
I think you have to show loyalty to readers and journalists. You have to give the credit to the journalists. I think you have to represent readers who aren't there to speak for themselves. And I think in general, like people need to dial in the negative opinions about people in general, because the more that you have, I mean, I think part of the issue is there was so much negative opinion about Donald Trump in the news that then the Republicans now no longer trust the news because it was just, you know, there's so much much emotional content, right? So I think in general, the news also just needs to dial it back on like negative opinions about people in general and make sure that they're only publishing information that is actually providing, you know, the data and details and statistics and information and things that people need to have to make their own judgment value. You right, know, right. Their own so value you're not, you're not own. paid to be judges, which we can all right. do on our own anyway. <laughs> That's right. No, we're, we're very good at that. Everyone's yeah. very good at that. <laughs> um, delivering results is number six in terms of a quality that builds trust. So again, I think, you know, rigorously adhering to those journalistic norms, having a track record of unbiased, factually accurate information, um, and making sure that you're performing that duty for the U.S. public that you're expected mm-hmm. to do as the watchdog of society, right? Um, and then obviously prioritizing um, accuracy over speed, which is right. something that we got into before. Um, get better. So get better in general just means con- you're continuously improving, right? You're as a business, as a leader, whoever, as a person. Um, so I think in general, the media just needs to be developing these feedback systems for how can we become better? How can we report the news better? How can we get more accurate? How can we get, you know, um, more trust from people in the accuracy of how we're presenting the information and things like that. So I think, you know, that that's kind of a, um, a be a constant learner learning for everyone, but for the media too. Um, confronting reality thing is important, right? Like you have to take on these issues head on and make sure that you're addressing the tough feedback and criticism and not I, I feel your like head this in the is sand. becoming like, a, a lesson on self-improvement almost like, <laughs> like, well, it is, it is really in the end it is right. I yeah, mean, yeah. and, and, you know, I mean, to that point, it's like, there is a macro and a, and a micro. So, yeah. you know, be the change you want to be in the world. Right. I right. mean, that's, so you have to do it as a person, then you have to do it as a brand. Yeah. And then you have to do it as a society. So I think what we're looking at, I mean, to your point, which is um, a good one is like, you know, there is a, there's an issue here where we all have a part to play. Yes. You yeah. know, e- even as individuals. So uh, confronting reality, clarifying expectations. So this is like, once again, distinguish the news coverage from opinion pieces. Uh, yeah. Don't let everything become one big soup. Um, practice accountability, right? You got to make sure that you're actually holding your news outlet accountable first and that you're taking responsibility for the results, good or bad. And you're, you know, you're the one that's on the line here. Um, yeah. 11 is listening first. So this is where, you know, a good leader, good person or somebody that inspires trust listens to people before they speak and they listen to people genuinely before making a decision or presenting an opinion. And so I think, you know, this is another example where if the media is able to to figure out what it is that addressers want, uh, uh, um, that readers want addressed, then they can actually, you know, diagnose what is going to be valuable information to them and provide it accordingly. Yeah. Keeping commitments is another one, right? So do what you say you're going to do, um, make all those commitments implicit, explicit. And then the last one, because I know we're up at time here is extending trust. So I think again, start with that propensity to trust your readers, right? And trust that they're going to be intelligent and able to interpret right. information and facts for themselves without this strong arming them into like your opinions and interpretations and colorations and uh, you know opinions about everything. So I think that that's uh, I think that's the last quality that we need in the media and yeah. obviously in ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this is like such a I mean, this is like, it is a hundred, you know, page presentation because it's, 
it's, there's so many different elements that have one made it, you know, made it a way where we don't trust the media. And then now to go back and like undo all the bad habits we have, um, you know, to, to repair ourselves. I think it is a, a bit of a long process. What do you think, you know, we're going into a new year. I cannot believe it. Like, I know <laughs> it's, it's like here already. I can't believe it either. It's, it's nuts, but it's crazy. the media landscape so volatile. I don't feel comfortable with it. Um, what do you think the shift is going to look like in the new year? Um, and you mentioned Substack and some alt, yep. like, like kind of alt media outlets. And, um, we're going to see maybe a little bit more of that, but what are the, some of the trends that you think are going to come out of this distrust? And do you think, how long do you think, and do you think we can like go back? So I think in general that the market forces are, I'm hopeful are going to help correct some of this. I think Substack's a great example of it because you're seeing people that are willing to put their dollar, you know, behind what they believe in. So if yeah. they trust, if they trust Glenn Greenwald, right. And they, and they believe in his reporting and they think it's independent and they feel like it's factually accurate and, and helpful to them and, you know, provides the information they need, they're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that it will turn into a situation where people are paying for things that they trust. Yeah. And that, that those market forces will then kind of self-correct. Um, that might be a little Pollyannish because obviously you've got all these big corporations that own these big media outlets that, yeah. um, are going to have lots of influence. Right. But I think in general, we're going to see a, a, just a continued fractalization of the media. Um, I think podcasts are another great example of this happening, right? Where you've just got podcasts coming up left and right. <laughs> and it's like every single tiny niche, you know, that anyone yeah. could ever want to hear about, there's a podcast for it. So in a way that's valuable because then, you know, even if it's a smaller listenership, that the people that you're getting in front of are the right people. Right. Right. So there's still a way of, of doing that. Um, I think that, you know, it's, I think it's going to take a while though, for a lot of these market forces to, to iron themselves out. And I think there's going to be a lot of competition even among the alt-right, you know, there's going to be all these different social platforms that are cannibalizing each other and things like that until there's some, some leveling out of, of a brand that people trust. But I it, think it sounds kind of like, you know, and I feel like journalists have always been influencers. We just didn't really see them that way. But I think that like the, the journalists that are willing to stand up, they, they're almost becoming activists. And mm -hmm. so like, do you think we're going to see like this era of like just extreme journalism activism because, you know, you are becoming, they're becoming influencers in their own right. They're launching their own platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that becomes something that takes over media too for a little while, maybe. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I, think so. I mean, cause I'm just thinking of like when we were, well, when I was young and like you know you really <laughs> trusted like Barbara Walters you really were like waiting like my mom was like huge 2020 fan and like every Friday we would sit there and watch the whatever 2020 episode and you're like trusting Barbara to get that story <laughs> and I, I feel like a lot of people have that kind of similar faith in like Oprah and like other you know I'm, I'm only naming women because that's all I could think of right now but um but there's that <laughs> fair enough <laughs> yeah there's that like you know, the trust that we once built with those types of influencers and those types of media and journalists um, that I think it sounds like kind of from this is like, they're going to kind of rise up again until the media can repair itself. I think so. I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, I think, I think, I mean, I, and I think, I mean, not to beat a dead horse here, but the Substack writers are a great example of it, right? Because they're the ones that are mm -hmm. kind of leading the charge and yeah. they've got, they've got these big followings and, you know, they're able to attract a, a pretty big audience and then those people are willing to pay for it. So I think that my hope is also, I mean, what I like about that is that journalists then also have a chance to benefit financially, whereas yeah. in the past they've been 
they've been pretty low on the totem pole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So suddenly, you know, if you're a good reporter and you've got, you know, great, great reporting, great facts, great stories, and people trust what you're putting out there, you can make a really good profit now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just this a is matter the, I mean, of it, then you have to market yourself because yeah. then suddenly you're now your own outlet. Yeah. So that's, that's the challenge I think for people that don't have a big following, but I think, you know, I mean, my hope is that people will be financially rewarded for doing good right journalism thing. Yeah, and then that good journalism will prevail. So that's my, again, I'm hopeful it's not just rose colored glasses because I feel like we need that as a society to come together. So we don't have this echo chamber of these two Americas <laughs> that are listening to completely different right. sources of information and news. And how do you ever come together as a society when that's happening? So it's yeah. not that we need somebody from on high to tell everyone to trust and listen to, but we do need source of information that we feel like we can actually get or at least to agree from. on like a few tenants, like these 13 yeah. tenants, right? Like let's, let's all yeah. agree that we're going to stick to this, stuff, this practice, you know, like these best yeah. practices. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a awesome conversation. I think it's something that everyone should be thinking about whether they're producing their own content, whether they're trusting the media, whether they're partnering with media and journalists. Um, I think this is a great way to kick off our series. And, and I think, um, you know, if you guys want to slow it down and go through the PowerPoint, <laughs> um, you'll definitely be able to see it, but, you know, connect with April on LinkedIn or social media. And I think um, this is a little bit of a journey, but it's a good conversation to start having. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you guys tomorrow in our next webinar. Um, and that, that's it for today. Bye. Bye.